All right, so we are officially starting the second segment in the cyber kill chain. It is the weaponization phase. So thank you guys all for coming out. And uh, I'm going to try and keep it to between 30 and 45 minutes today because um, Keith and I have prepared some machines for you guys to actively scan. Um, so without further ado, and we'll get to that at the end, you know, we'll explain to you what you should do and how you should uh, set up your tools and stuff, but uh, so let's get rolling. So just a, a little overview, a, a reminder of what we talked about last week, and we'll do a recap of the, the kill chain every segment. Um, so the, the kill chain is composed of the, the seven steps that you see here, the seven phases. And uh, again, it's just a bird's eye view of what a, an attack life cycle looks like. Um, so in this case, and I need to remind everyone that we're not encouraging you do any of these things. Um, we want to remind you that uh, doing anything that we teach you without explicit, written, and um, bound by contract permission is illegal. So please do not do this to anyone except for your own networks that you have full control and ownership of. So uh, last week we talked about recon. Recon consists of uh, gathering intel on your target, defining your target, determining the uh, the scope of your, your target, um, and, and really just gathering everything that you possibly can that's publicly and openly available um, to gather and and that doesn't just mean googling the target it doesn't just mean um, finding documents that have been public publicly posted online it also means using passive tools to gather network details um, including uh, what what IP addresses are live on the subnet that that uh, those targets belong to it may even be just discovering IP addresses because you may not have an IP address to begin with um, it may be filtering out so part of recon may involve, um, I would say honestly, recon mostly just involves gathering as much intel as possible. And then the real filtering comes into this next phase, weaponization. <clears throat> so why is it called weaponization? Well, you've, you've gathered a ton of stuff during recon. Now it's time to turn that into um, actual attack vectors that can be used to exploit the target. So, um, weaponization consists of maybe more aggressive scans. Let's say you've discovered certain ports on the victim machines that you want to investigate a little more intensely. So you'll do more aggressive scans. Um, you'll use the, the, the different scanning scripts that are available on Nmap. Um, you'll use maybe more specific tools that are tailored for that specific service. Uh, Metasploit has a lot of um, exploitation, or not exploitation, they have a lot of, uh, what's the word for it? It's under auxiliaries. It's like scanners or something. But they've got a lot of additional utilities you can use to uh, to scan the services. It might be enumeration. Um, so yeah, uh, and then, you know, you, as you can see, here's the rest of the steps that are in the kill chain, and we'll have a segment on each of them. I realized that I put nec our next meeting as exploitation, it's actually going to be delivery, so I'm going to push the exploitation event up two weeks and put another event for delivery. Um, so yeah, uh, as I was kind of saying before, you start with your recon, you gain a ton of intel, and then you work on to the next step, which is weaponization, where you take that intel and you boil it, the intel, and you boil it down into its most um, useful information. Uh, and you design attack paths based on the information that you've gathered, uh, but you haven't exploited anything yet. You haven't delivered any payloads yet. Um, this is the phase where you're crafting payloads if you're, you know, a master hacker, or you're you're just finding the payloads that you need to use to exploit the services. Um, in the case of pen testers, you're typically not going to be writing exploits. You're just going to be using what's publicly known, um, what's what's already been developed by other people. Um, but in the case of, uh, you know, let's say an advanced persistent threat like um, Russian hackers or something like that, they, they'll probably be sitting there and they'll be looking at all these different, uh, um, 
Oh, a pen tester is a it's a penetration tester. So it's it's someone who's hired by companies to come in and um, do active and and passive audits of the uh, of the network and stuff like that. So they basically simulate attackers, uh, but they're just given permission to do everything they do. Yeah, yeah, it's like white hat. Um, that's actually what I'm doing this summer is uh, working as a pen tester, which is pretty fun. So <clears throat> an APT, though, an advanced, advanced persistent threat, they'll sit there and they'll probably discover um, vulnerabilities that nobody knows about, and they'll keep them secret so that they can continue to exploit with them. Um, and then delivery is the act, the, uh, you, you've, you know, you've developed your payload and weaponization in delivery. You're delivering that payload to the target in exploitation. The target, um, the payload is being exploited. Sometimes um, during the delivery phase, you deliver it to a vulnerable service that then exploits your payload and gives you a, a root shell or something like that. Um, sometimes it's a victim on the uh, internal network that, that clicks the payload or activates it or runs it by accident, not knowing that it's a malicious payload. So we'll talk, and you know, as we get into those phases, we'll talk more about what each of those entails. Um, there's a lot of social engineering and delivery. Okay, so again, recon to weaponization. The whole point of recon was to find a way in, right? Uh, and but you can't find a way in unless you understand what you're looking at. So all of that uh, intelligence needs to be transformed into an attack. Um, you know, you may have found IP addresses, you may have found the list of running services, you may have enumerated um, human information like email addresses, um, staff hierarchies, you might, you might have uh, enumerated more contact info like phone numbers, um, names, that kind of stuff. Because if you're going to do a spear phishing attack, uh, which is essentially just a more targeted phishing or email phishing attack, um, then you'll be, you'll want to masquerade as somebody right so that's kind of a, an important thing to figure out is like who's who's boss right and who should i target that has control or who you know that kind of thing um so yeah it's it's uh it's a first like the weaponization phase again is that time to to plan out your phishing campaign it's to search for exploitations um it's to discover whether or not these services are actually vulnerable uh, and that can be by again just doing your research um but i have this picture here just to show that like you're graphing out your uh, your paths so uh like like i kind of mentioned a moment ago you need to learn to recognize vulnerabilities um because like let's say you do find the the running version or the running services on the machine well who knows if it's actually vulnerable right um so if you're lucky and I'd say it's prob it's it's less common that the services um, don't show their version numbers because from what I've experienced so far, a lot of people are kind of lazy <laughs> with tightening defenses. So you'll usually find the version number. With the version number, you look uh, you search for on places like uh, exploit DB or exploit database. Um, where there's just a huge repository of um, developed payloads for for vul vulnerable services. And those payloads are essentially proof of concept payloads. Um, now, the whole nature of like when a service becomes vulnerable and then security researchers develop payloads for it and the time that they give these zero days to, you know, the companies who who are vulnerable or who are responsible for the zero days the time that these researchers give them to like um basically cover their their butts and fix it before the researchers release the patches or re release the the proof of concepts and stuff is it's, it's such an interesting uh dynamic but it's it's out there and that's that's just how it needs to be in order for the world to be more secure so yeah, uh, uh, and that's kind of what I was, t this, this paragraph here is kind of what I was just talking about, so that's good. Okay, um, now, earlier I mentioned, you know, if you're an elite hacker, you'll be developing exploits. Uh, that's, for most of us, that's 15, 20 years into the field, man. Like, that's a hard thing to do. If you're developing exploits, um, you're pretty legendary at, uh, at hacking. You, you have to have a, a seriously intense understanding of 
of how everything works. Um, you have to be skilled with programming. You have to be skilled with uh, network, like understanding how networking happens. Um, and that's those are not small feats, man. Um, that's that takes a lot of experience to get there. But thankfully, other people are already doing all that. So it's usually just a matter of time before a zero day comes out. And it's just a matter of time before a proof of concept comes out. Like when log for your log for shell happened, um, there was proof of concept code out in the wild within days. It was so fast. Um, dirty pipe. Yeah, <laughs> that's a pretty big one too. Um, I don't know as much about dirty pipe. I didn't do any presentations on that. And so maybe Thomas can give a, give us a rundown of it one of these days. Uh, and so that's, that's the thing, right? Um, it's one thing developing your own exploits, but it's a, it's another thing and it's more achievable to understand the exploits. Um, you know, that's more within our grasp as, uh, as students of hacking. So when you're researching the vulnerabilities and you're trying to find exploitable uh, exploits and payloads that have been developed, you know, these proof of concepts, um, you kind of need to understand what's going on in order to use it. So you may not need to know, you know, what's happening in the hexadecimal like you see in these pictures, but you, you need to know from kind of a higher level how the payload is going to be executed in order to properly do it. Now, frameworks like Metasploit automate so much of it. Um, it's, it's like as close to it gets as just like type execute and it's hacked um, with a lot of these Metasploit exploits. If you're lucky, um, you'll, you'll find something like that. But most of the time, it's, it's more complicated and you'll have to set up the groundwork to use the exploit. Um, yeah. Uh, and then, you know, let's say you, you've you done your groundwork, you found services, but they're not vulnerable, but you found a website that's not like a third-party website, like, I don't know, you know those, those websites you can go to, like, uh, crap, what are they called? You just pay, and then they... Uh, you can pay for like a template and then you can put in your custom stuff, but pretty much everything about it is managed by them. Um, those ones you're probably not going to find a vulnerability in. Um, they're usually a lot better about keeping their things locked down. But uh, if the company or organization that you're looking at, yeah, Wix, Squarespace, exactly. Thank you for, thanks, thank you for typing those in. Um, but if you're looking at an organization who had to build their own website from scratch, they had to hire developers to write it all for them, um, you're very likely to find vulnerabilities. And uh, there is a good number of organizations that do build their own websites and host it themselves and stuff. And so, uh, and it might not necessarily be their like public facing website. It might be a backend portal for staff or it might be a contact portal for this or for that, right? So you, that's another part of why it's important to do your recon so you can discover those kinds of, uh, of services. Yeah, you're probably, I haven't been following that so I gotta <laughs> just keep going. Um, so you, you need to, if you find a website, you should be figuring out if it's a third party website you know, not hosted by this organization. And you could do that just by checking, like, you could do some simple DNS queries and stuff just to figure out where, where it's being hosted from. And then you can look up those IP addresses and usually it'll say on it like, oh, it's hosted by da-da-da hosting company. Oh, that's usually um, provided by Wix or something like that, right? So you can usually figure that stuff out pretty quick. Um, but then if it, if it is actually hosted by them, then you can use a whole number of uh, tools um, to automate your searching for vulnerabilities in the web interface. Um, tools like Burp Suite, SQL Map, OWASP Zap, uh, WordPress Scan, so WP Scan. Um, and then there's so many different things you can do on a website to uh, identify security misconfigurations yeah, insecure designs, vulnerable and outdated components. That picture on the right's not just fancy. That that's a 
a, a chart or a table of uh, a list of um, the most common vulnerabilities from 2021 in websites. Um, and so each, each and every single one of these is worth looking up. Um, and each one of them is kind of, can be kind of complex to understand, um, like SSRF and CSRF and stuff. Those are tricky. Um, so I'm a big fan of Burp Suite. I use that one a lot. Um, and it's cool because with Burp Suite, you can capture like your, uh, HTML request or HTTP request, and then you can save that request and pass it into SQL, SQL map. And then SQL map will go and check all the different, uh, um, what are they called again? Like entry fields on the website, anything you can enter text into and send to the server. SQL map will check them for SQL vulnerabilities and SQL map is thorough, man. It's really good. Uh, WP scan. That one's pretty important. If like so many websites out there are WordPress websites, um, and you'd be surprised how many WordPress websites, um, are running outdated plugins and that kind of stuff. WordPress scan will scan for those outdated plugins. Then you can look up that plugin and find what the vulnerability is. So you know, sometimes it's something crazy and you'll get a, it'll let you do directory traversal and then that'll get you access or let's say it, it'll enumerate the, the users that are on the, the WordPress website and then you can just log in as the admin and then from there, from the back end of WordPress, if you're admin, you can go into the, if they if they haven't cleaned out their old um, WordPress template things, you can go in there and inject JavaScript to pop a root shell and then just, yeah, it's freaking nuts, man. So there's there's some, uh, some pretty cool attack vectors with uh, WordPress. And that's just, you know, I'm not even, that's not in depth at all. Like I'm barely skimming the surface with what you can do with web vulnerabilities. That that's the biggest beast when it comes to, uh, it's a combination of everything really. So let's say you've, you've gone through all your, uh, all your attack vectors. Um, you've, you've tried to find services. You've tried to find exploits for these services, but you can't find anything. These guys have really locked everything down. Good for them. Um, but in that case, you might have to go the less glamorous route, the less sophisticated route, and perform some fish, some uh, phishing attacks. So GoFish is actually a, you know, it's a paid platform that you can use. Uh, it says it's the open source, but they also provide a paid service. Um, Social engineering toolkits also really useful for that but you have to do a lot of your own configuring like setting up your own mail servers and stuff um phishing man that's that's one thing that's not going to go away anytime soon um if you can impersonate an it administrator and send it out to the company like if you manage to get all the or a huge list of um staff emails you could do that if you have a linkedin account you can scrape linkedin for the the company uh, staff names and then uh just generate a list of their like if you know what the the typical staff email extension is you can generate a list of all the staff emails just from like linkedin and all that stuff if, if the list isn't already out there um and then from there uh you just send out like a mass email to everyone or or maybe you select a few people that you know have uh, important roles and then uh do phishing emails like uh attaching malicious files for them to click or a link to cloned login portals where they type in their credentials and then from there let's say you get access to their azure portal or something like that um, there's there's some crazy stuff you can do just with phishing alone um, and that's always going to be an attack vector as long as it's uh as long as it's not a zero trust model out there as long as we are the way we are um, it's going to be phishing will be an avenue um, and this is one that we're always seeing. So, and it, there's always a ridiculously high success rate with those, man. It's so funny. Okay. Uh, and let's say fishing, you don't really want to try that. Well, dude, brute forcing never ends. Um, we, we do, uh, active recon 
maybe, maybe uh, it's called threat intelligence gathering where we check we're able to to parse the deep web to find um and by parse the deep web i mean like uh known marketplaces where user credentials are being sold stolen user credentials are being sold and so we're able to parse those and then also some of these companies man they have these crazy infrastructures where they're, where they're able to to check their user accounts to see which ones have been popped and stuff um and like they watch like the most recent logins and stuff like that and how many failed attempts there were on each account um and so with that uh my one of my colleagues has told me with the company he works for they've seen attacks where these hackers have come in and made two or three million attempts on I don't know, 20,000 accounts and successfully popped five or something between five to 30 accounts, but that's all it takes. And then they sell those credentials and, uh, and someone has access to those accounts and these are for any kinds of services, right? Like this happens to Netflix all the time. It happens to anyone where there's tons and tons of customer accounts, uh, essentially. So you might be wondering like, well, how the heck do these guys do this? Well, uh, firstly, there's credential stuffing and there's password spraying. So password spraying is just knowing the email and then brute forcing the password. Uh, but then credential stuffing is uh, you've seen successful leaked credentials in the past. Like let's say there was a, a leak from uh, a known breach. Well, then they'll take that username or that email and they'll try that same email on another service with the same password from that previous breach. So that's a credential stuffing attack and so they'll do those but you might be wondering well like how do these attackers do this without getting like blacklisted or something well they're using disposable ip addresses and they can get that from anything they could they could have set up botnets they could just be using uh cloud you know elastic ip addresses or, or whatever it might be there's there's many different ways to get yourself a big pool of disposable ip addresses um and then from that they set up their their spoofers to or their the brute forcing tools to spoof the browser fingerprints so that they can you know i guess i guess it'd be considered a spoofing the operating system in the browser fingerprint um so it looks like a different person or it looks like they're logging in differently every time um so anyways they, they can get complex and that's how they're able to 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 make two or three million attempts and successfully get just a few um so anyways, I, the other thing to note about that, that's it's kind of a, you, you might be like, okay, well, why, you know, yeah, I could see it being profitable for them to hack a Netflix account and then sell it. Um, but like, I don't know, let's say it's, uh, let's say it's someone's like WestJet account or something. Well, WestJet hosts their own website, right? Well, if I know anything about web development, the internal side of the website is going to be way, like, the developers don't usually pay as much attention to security on the inside because, you know, customers have been validated. Why would they be trying to hack it, right? Um, now, that might not always be the mentality, but who knows, right? So what if an attacker buys that that uh, login and then from there tries to exploit the uh, the web interface on the inside. All it takes is one vulnerable input field, and uh, you know a hacker could potentially pop a shell. Okay, so recap: um, the key to planning an exploit is to understand the thing you want to exploit. So what I have here is just a picture of infrastructure 2.0. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but I just liked this picture because it showed uh, what's what might be going on on a, ser a server that you're trying to uh, exploit. Um, so you've got like the hosting, the thing that's hosting the operating system, and then you've got the storage, the at the network. Um, there might be backend data networks that are going uh, locally between devices that you can't see. Um, shared storage, end users, that kind of stuff. But uh, you need to understand. When you're when you're scanning uh, a system that 
you know, let's say you only see two services there, there's more than just that going on, right? There's going to be tons of things running in the background. Um, so you need to, to gain a grasp of like what may or may not be there, even if you can't see it. Um, and then also understand with a web server, it's not just like Apache running. It, it could be an entire stack of, uh, of, of services, and one of those might be vulnerable, right? And so understanding those stacks, um, those network stacks, those uh, web, uh, web server stacks, that kind of stuff, can help you gain a grasp of where to put the, you know, where you can exploit a service, uh, where that might be possible, where it's not possible. Um, it just it just helps for you as the attacker to understand what the stack might look like. And and I'm approaching it from a super general perspective to try and catch it all. So this might not be useful to hear, but just think about that, I guess. <laughs> okay. So the final recap is, uh, again, the things you found in Recon help you decide your attack path. Um, understand the services that you've discovered. You're, you're going to need to do your research. You'll need to find um, the right tools to attack those services. Like if you figure out it's a WordPress website, well, you can use uh, WP Scan to uh, do a ton of good stuff and gain a, a lot more intel on that WordPress server. Um, you need to find, if you've discovered vulnerabilities, you need to find exploits for those vulnerabilities or develop an exploit yourself. Um, sometimes there's a vulnerability and there's, there's a, a proof of concept, but the proof of concept's a little janky and it doesn't work for your exact situation. So you might have to modify it until it does work. And that's kind of like the easier way to like do the configuring or, or take what they've done and write your own proof of concept based on what they did. Um, that's, I've had to do that once or twice uh, when I was trying to demonstrate the log4j exploit. It's a lot harder now because everyone's locked everything down. But, um, but then at the end of the day, uh, an attacker is always going to try phishing. They're always going to try brute forcing because um, that stuff just never goes away. And the success rate is just too valid to be denied. All right. So I hope I didn't bore you guys to sleep. That was shorter than last week's, but we're going to do our workshop now. I'm going to turn off the recording. And...